Baiju's exam prep IAS has been the gateway to your IAS prep. Our YouTube channel is going to get even better from 2023. Starting 2nd January, the Hindu newspaper analysis will be conducted live every day at 10 a.m. by our beloved faculties. Not only this, we have a whole new set of initiatives lined up for the new year to help you clear this prestigious exam. So subscribe to our YouTube channel now and give wings to your civil services dream. Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. Let's get started and look into the first article. The first article says a retelling of the Indian migrant workers flight. Let us try and understand what is this article all about. The article on the first makes the reference to the International Migrants Day. This is observed annually every year on December 18th. So on December 18, 1990, the General Assembly adopted a resolution on the International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families. What is this International Migrants Day? We have number of people who leave their home countries, travel to another country. This is for the sake of work. It can be because of the refugee crisis. It can be because of the human rights violations. It can be for any reasons. It can also be environmental refugees as well. So these people leave their home countries. They also go to another country. So there is migration that is happening from one country to another. And let's say there is another example. We have workers who go for a temporary period of time. There are women workers who also go to another country. Let's say for example we have the nurses. These people who move from one country to another have their own share of grievances. They also become victims of crime as well. They'll have ethnic conflicts as well. And at the same time, basic human rights are not provided to such people. In all these cases, how is that the government is going to safeguard them? How is that their grievances will be addressed? Bringing an awareness about the flight of the international migrants is what is called as the International Migrants Day. As part of the assignment, please put on the comment section what is the theme for the year 2022 for the International Migrants Day. So this article here is primarily focusing about Indian migrants. So we have the Indian migrants who go to number of countries, especially the Western Asian countries. In Western Asian countries, there are instances where there have been large scale human rights violations as well. Grievance is not addressed. So it is in this particular backdrop. We have the author saying that the government of India will have to consider the issue issues and concerns faced by these people ultimately address all these concerns. Let us try and understand what is the author trying to convey. Let's look into the data. According to International Organization of Migration, World's Migration Report 2022, there were 281 million international migrants globally in 2020, with nearly two-thirds being labor migrants. While there were 169 million labor migrants in 2019, the figure touched 164 million in 2020. In the large pool of migrants, South Asia's share is nearly 40%. Further, South Asia Gulf Migratory Corridor is the world's largest migratory corridor. So people from South Asia moving to the Gulf Cooperation Council's countries has become the major source of migration. Long-term data on international migration show that migration is not uniform across the world and is shaped by economic, geographic, demographic and other factors resulting in distinct migration pattern such as migration corridors developed over many years. Recently, there were cases of around 300 Indian engineers from Tamil Nadu who were trafficked to Myanmar to work for a crypto scam. Nearly 20 Indian nurses trafficked to United Arab Emirates for fake job offers. Both groups had migrated after a desperate post-COVID-19 job hunt. These people had lost their jobs. They were not able to get suitable jobs for their profiles and ultimately they had to go through this crisis and that is the primary reason they were looking for the jobs and they ended up in fake jobs as well. According to Kerala government, some 1.7 million Keralites retained from abroad during the pandemic between June 2020 and June 2021 
1.5 million had suffered job losses. None of them had a proper plan to survive and were staring at no jobs or self-employment opportunities in Kerala. It is in this particular backdrop we have to understand what are the issues that are faced by the migrant community. The first is in reference to the Archaic Law. We have one of the law called as the Immigration Act of 1983. This happens to be a law which was drafted in the 1983. Is it changed? now no we do not have the updated laws we do not have laws which is able to change with changing times as well the bills have been proposed but this has not fortified and converted into an act as well so the immigration act which was passed in 1983 has not looked at the digital issues has not looked into the grievance faced by the victims and ideally a bill or an act should have been right in place right now but that we do not have is the first major concern so the author in this particular case goes on to say what we require is a smooth robust immigration bill in the parliament which has to be discussed so the first key issue is we do have an act this is about addressing the grievances of the people but this is outdated and has not changed with changing times is the first major concern the second happens to be the kafala system. What is this kafala system? The practice of kafala system has been prevalent in the following countries or group of countries. Gulf Cooperation Council, which includes Bahrain, Kuwait, Omar, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UAE. It is also present in Jordan as well as Lebanon. So what is this kafala system? It is a sponsorship system that binds migrant workers to one employer in many countries of West Asia. The kafala system has three bodies, a migrant laborer, an employer who is the sponsor and is called as kafil and then there is a contract period. So what exactly happens? You have the kafil or the employer. This person wants a laborer. So the minute he gives permission for the laborer, he gets the visa sanctioned for them and once he goes to any of these countries, his passport would be taken away by this person. So this means this visa is granted by that country primarily because the owner is asking for it. The owner happens to be the sponsor for this individual. So once this individual heads to that country, the individual's passport is taken away by this employer which is called as the kafala system. A migrant worker in the countries practice this sponsorship system is legally bound to his employer without kafil's permission. The migrant worker cannot enter or leave the country nor transfer his or her employment to enter a country. A migrant gets tied to one sponsor who coordinates with the immigration authorities about the former's arrival and departure as per the contractual employment. If in case the person is not happy with that particular job and he wants to leave, he cannot leave the country because his passport is with this employer. That happens to be the major reason as to why people are not able to leave these Gulf countries in case of an issue. So the first major issue happens to be the Immigration Act. It is outdated. We have to change with changing times. The second happens to be the Kafala system where the employer takes away the passport even if the employee wants to live. He is not able to live and there have been number of examples that we have seen in the West Asia. And during the pandemic as well, there were a couple of other issues. What was it? One was this person was taken of the job so he was already unemployed he was coming under the kafala system so he was not able to live and at the same time this person was not getting the salary as well there were large number of people who were staying in rooms there were 12 to 13 people who were also staying in rooms so there was no hygiene in this particular place there was no compensation played to this particular people and there were also residual dues as well salaries were not paid on time and at the same time they were not able to take care of themselves and forget about all the social welfare schemes and programs forget about the insurance programs all these were not provided to the people so what they had was irregular payment 
poor working conditions they did not have any labor rights that they could actually negotiate with the employer and there was absence of the grievance readdressal mechanism for these migrants so they are the indian citizens they go up to another country they are only working there as well so where do they put out their grievance that grievance addressal mechanism was not present so all this meant that this article goes on to say these issues will ideally have to be addressed by the government of india now there are women issues as well indian nurses and caregivers have been working in the most volatile countries such as iraq syria libya yemen israel and even remote papua new guinea women workers ventured to these countries using the services of recruiting agencies on account of major domestic problems therefore the government should comprehensively assess the situation of the migrant women and create women centric and right based policies as well in order to overcome all these issues in the past the government had what is called as a government portal called as madad madad is basically one of the government of india's portal as well so this had enabled all the migrant workers from the country to file their grievances in fact we have the ministry of external affairs its website goes on to say that about 95% of the registered grievances were solved as well people have the grievances so in order to put out their grievances they had a portal and that portal is madad says the government of india added to it we also have the civil society governments from multiple south asian countries as well they have also voiced these grave human right concerns and what we have is the abu dhabi dialogue which happened to be a regional forum where there were cooperation between asian countries as well as the gulf countries so the forum is also looking at developing information about the workers promoting technology platforms reforms in the domestic workers law as well so abu dhabi dialogue was also one of the measure taken by the south asian countries so what are the measures that we may have to take in the near future indian missions or embassy should make the recruitment process more transparent put workers contract details on the web let's say there is a person who is leaving from india this person's details will be given to the recruitment agency so this recruitment agency's details should also be put on the website so the person that is the employee going to the gulf country his information should also be given as well and if this recruitment agency has violated certain terms and conditions in that case it should be blacklisted and also put up on the website as well fraud in the recruitment by the agencies should be treated as a criminal act and should not be dealt under the company law in gulf the kafils keep the passport of the foreign workers hence in crisis they don't have the pro- papers to prove their nationality so the indian authority should issue an identity or a biometric card to every migrant worker this card can also be used for banking casting nra votes and establishing identity during evacuation and government should also ensure the migrant workers so on distress return they can start their own business we did discuss about the state of kerala a large number of people who are working in the gulf countries came back during the covid 19 they had no jobs at hand so in case there is such eventuality that occurs they should also be provided insurance prior soft loans should also be provided to them so that they kick start their journey in our country these are some of the measures that we should be able to take in order to prevent the migration crisis going forward what we require is a multi stakeholder approach where the government trade unions recruitment agents civil society can all bring notable changes so it is in this context that the government of india should introduce a new bill in the form of immigration bill 2021 and expedite this entire process because what we have is a old law it is not changing with changing times so what we require is a new law says this article it is this that we have to understand with respect to this article now let's look into the next article this article says focus on africa the heart of the global south the article here is speaking about three important parameters one is africa's relationship with united states of america second it speaks about its relationship with china and third it is speaking africa's relationship with india so it says that india has been able to establish a very good relationship with africa but can also learn lessons from china so it is advising both usa and india 
to learn few lessons from China so that we can enhance on the relationship with the African countries. What is the context? We recently had the US Africa's Leaders Summit. In the summit, which was held in Washington between December 13 to 15, leaders of as many as 49 countries and their chair of the African Union participated from Africa in United States of America. So people went up to United States of America. They did discuss about the future prosperity for African countries. US President Joe Biden has not visited any of the African countries, but he played a very good host when it comes to this meeting. So they did discuss about the political issue. They did discuss about the economic issue. They did also speak about security related issue as well and ultimately they said that suitable amount of money would be provided by United States of America to the African countries. Added to it, they did also discuss the pandemic as well. Health did impact African countries. So they said apart from the health related issues, climate change is another area, food security is another area and we have to deepen the bilateral relationship individually and at the same time Africa as a whole set this particular meeting. So they were trying to look at all the challenges faced by the African countries and ultimately address these issues. So what was the outcome of this particular summit? First, the US announced its support for the African Union to join the G20 as a permanent member. So it is supporting that as part of G20, African Union will be representing in the G20 and it will become the permanent member. Second, the US said it fully supports reforming the UN Security Council to include permanent representation for Africa. As of now, we have the United Nations Security Council, which has permanent members in the form of US, UK, France, Russia and China. We do not have any of the permanent membership from the African continent. So, United States of America has said that there will be a proposal made when it comes to representation from Africa. Third, a promise for the President and the Vice President to visit Africa next year was made. This will be a refreshing change as no US President has been seen in Africa since 2015. In fact, we had the President of United States of America who also said that he would want to visit Africa in person so that they can deliberate more issues in the near future. So what are the measures taken by United States of America? The US has announced new investments and initiatives including 21 billion to the International Monetary Fund to provide access to necessary financing for low and middle income countries and 10 million for a pilot program to boost the security capacity of the African partners. The administration indicated it planned to invest 55 billion in Africa over the next three years, working closely with the Congress. So whenever we speak about Africa as a whole, what we basically look at is the grants, the loans that are given by the countries. When you speak about China, China has made huge scale of investments in the African countries. India, when we speak about India and Africa's relationship, India is also trying to make a huge investments in Africa as well. So whenever we speak about Africa, the major thing is what is the quantum of funds that are received from the country. If you look at United States of America, United States of America has promised all these things currently. But let's draw a comparison with China. China has emerged as the largest trading partner and the fourth largest investor in the African continent ahead of United States through its steady diplomacy and extensive economic engagement. In 2021, while the US-Africa trade stood at 44.9 billion, China-Africa trade exchanges stood at $254 billion. The US investment stock in Sub-Saharan Africa was $30.31 billion last year compared with China's total investment in Africa of 43.4 billion in 2020. So when we compare, when we juxtapose two investments made by United States of America and China, what we see is vast difference between these two countries. So what are the lessons that United States of America can learn from China? When it comes to China, China has a forum. This forum is called as Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, which is also called as FOCAC. 
in this case what exactly happens you have constant meetings between african countries and china you also have leaders visiting as well they also discuss about the investment plans they also discuss about what grants have to be given from china to all these african countries so there is constant interaction that happens between china as well as african countries as part of this forum this is the first lesson that has to be taken by united states of america so basically as of now the interaction between usa and africa is comparatively on a lesser level in comparison to china so it goes on to say when it comes to focac it is composed of ministers and leaders of africa and china who meet once in 3 years alternatively in beijing and an african capital it can be any country and its capital the chinese president participates in deliberations in person or digitally china has a full fledged interministerial mechanism to ensure timely implementation of the focac decisions the last meeting held in dhaka in 2000 21 express support for the chinese agenda that is one china principle what is this one china principle when you look at china we have the people's republic of china which is under the control of the communist party then you also have taiwan as well it says it is independent and at the same time it is the major stakeholder of china so if a country believes in one china principle it basically goes on to say that taiwan is not an independent country but is part of china this happens to be the one china principle so this idea has been pushed in the african countries and african countries have also acknowledged in the one china principle the global developmental initiative the belt and road initiative which is about the infrastructure development and the vision of a community within a shared future it also applauded the decision by the 2018 focac summit in beijing to build a china africa community that strives for win win cooperation for years the chinese foreign minister begins his annual series of foreign visits by traveling to africa whatever flaws there may be in Afri china's economic diplomacy in africa there are many its consistent attention to africa contains a useful lesson says the author so the author goes on to say that as of now united states of america has fallen behind china when it comes to its investment so what we have to do is make huge amount of investment from united states of america to africa and at the same time they also have to take the feedback constantly from the african countries improve on the relationship front as well so they want the us china and all other partners to work with them because africa's needs are huge so in order to overtake china what you require is more investment says the author the author also goes on to bring in india as well when it comes to india india already has a very good relations with african countries in fact we have much older relationship and richer relationship with africa in comparison to china and united states of america so what we have to do is we have to ensure that this relationship is further enhanced as of now china is making a lot of investment india should also have a keen eye on african countries there are few differences when it comes to how india operates in africa and how china operates in africa many countries in fact people and individuals are also not happy with the chinese way of operation which is an advantage for india what is the difference between the chinese way of operation and the india way of operation when it comes to china what exactly happens there is dead trap diplomacy as we have discussed in the past as well what china does is it gives huge amount of loans and when these loans are not paid back by that country it will take away their assets and that particular country's assets will be taken over by china for few years so they give huge amount of money in the form of loans when countries are not able to pay back their assets are taken as lease for number of years this is not done by india one such example that we have is the hamantota port in sri lanka there are many other countries which have also fallen to china in this debt trap whenever you have the chinese entering the african countries they also take the contractors as well 
they also take people as well this basically means it is the chinese contractors who are working in that particular area it is the chinese citizens who are working in an african project but what is the difference between india and china when it comes to india they empower the local citizens so india might have taken the contract of this african project but at the same time it empowers the local citizens so whichever is the country its people will be employed as part of the project but when it comes to china it is the chinese officials who will be working in that particular domain let me give you an example in pakistan in baluchistan this is become the major problem on one side baluchistan people are not employed but it is the chinese citizens who are employed as part of this particular project there is a lot of hue and cry in pakistan which happens to be an all weather friend of china so imagine what could also happen in africa so india also has an advantage here as well china has the one road one belt initiative and at the same time india and japan have come up with a asia africa growth corridor as well so this means that india and japan have also come together to prioritize the importance of infrastructure development in africa and they are providing an alternative to the one belt one road initiative of china and also remember when it comes to indian businesses they have a cultural advantage with respect to african countries african people also come to india they also study as well they also take the goodwill along with them this is not happening with china so indian businesses have a cultural advantage people to people relationship which is not the case with respect to china so all of these will have to be further in enhanced and what india has to do is increase the relationship with respect to the african countries so this article goes on to conclude the g20 presidency is india's opportunity to ensure that african union becomes a permanent member of g20 and at the same time all the progress that is made will be taken with india united states of america as well as african countries that is au together it is this that we have to understand with respect to this article now let's look into the next article this article says what is the cag audit report on assam's nrc let us try and understand what is this article all about what is the nrc nrc basically stands for the national register of citizens what is this national register of citizens we are all citizens of india but there are few people who belong to the state of assam when it comes to assam what exactly is the issue you had the east pakistan which happens to now become bangladesh when bangladesh was formed large number of people started moving to assam as well this basically meant that the original inhabitants the natives were overcrowded by the citizens of pakistan that is east pakistan which went on to become bangladesh so there were grave human right violations that took place in east pakistan which is now bangladesh so people started moving from bangladesh and they entered assam so here is the major issue once people start entering assam one there is demographic change there are cultural differences as well and these people somehow want to survive and they also work in this particular area for low wages when they work for low wages people who are already present they would not get their jobs and ultimately there is economic clash there is also political clash there is also cultural clash as well in order to make sure that natives are identified what we have is the national register of citizens which basically means they are the citizens of india and at the same time they are residents of the state of assam for which what we require is one of the dates to be identified so an nrc was first created in 1951 in assam to identify those born in india and migrants from erstwhile east pakistan now bangladesh in 2013 the supreme court issued directions to the center to start initiate an exercise in assam to update this 1951 register the order was based on a petition by an ngo named assam public works the first draft was listed in 2018 the final list was published in the year 2019 so this nrc will basically identify who these people who are originally the residents of assam and rest who have come from some other country they will be not part of this nrc in order to ensure that this nrc is implemented in order to make sure that we have a database what we require is a software 
this software will have people names listed on this particular software which will help us identify who is part of NRC who is the resident of Assam this is where the major issue comes up says the CAG audit according to the CAG audit it goes on to say that this entire software process which was supposed to have been developed this due process of software development that had to be taken there is a flaw in the software development itself first major point that it identifies is with respect to the vendors who are the people who have got this particular contract how have they got this contract did we go for an eligibility assessment if this is done so was it transparent is the first question asked by CAC the second is with respect to the cost originally it was envisaged that this whole project will cost about 288.18 crore but over a period of time the cost has escalated to about 1602.66 crores this basically means that there's exorbitant spending made for this particular project added to it CAG has also gone on to say that we have data entry operators who are these data entry operators let's say I am an individual I give the information I get the documents and show it to the person so the person is entering the data onto the system so this person is the data entry operator according to CAG the minimum wages that was supposed to have been paid to the data entry workers that is also not paid says the CAG audit system so on one side the software which was ideally supposed to have been assessed that is not assessed the software itself is not right first is that second is the cost has also increased as well third these data operators should have been paid the minimum wages they were also not paid the minimum wages says this particular report on NRC it is this that we have to understand with respect to this article now let's look into the next article this article says Odisha orders CID probe into death of Putin critic let us try and understand what is this article all about we have one of the Russian oligarch called as Pavel Anto he was about 65 years he was a Russian national who died mysteriously falling from the third floor window of a hotel in Raigad region of Odisha where he was holidaying to celebrate his 66th birthday authorities and the Russian embassy are treating it as a suicide case Pavel Anto was a Russian sausage tycoon according to the Russian media reports he was one of the leading manufacturers of meat sausages in Russia he founded the meat company Vladimir standard it is in this particular backdrop we have to understand a term what is called as the Russian oligarch who is an oligarch he happens to be a very rich business leader who also has a lot of political influence in Russia so in Russia a Russian oligarchs are people who are men and specifically are connected to Vladimir Putin who is the president of Russia many of them are uber rich they have assets which are worth billions of dollars they have exotic cars they also have shady business practices as well many oligarchs are corrupt in themselves and that is why the oligarchy is also called as kleptocracy when it comes to Russia now the big question is what was he doing in India why was he celebrating his birthday in Odisha why was he living in a three-star hotel and not a five-star hotel he was a billionaire for a billionaire who has vast amount of wealth what was he doing in a three-star hotel so the question is was it a suicide is the big question we also have to understand he was not just a Russian businessman he was also a politician as well he was also deputy of the legislative assembly of the Latimer region but do note everything was going good for him but recently he had made a comment the comment said a girl has been pulled out from under the rubble the girl's father appears to have died the mother is being pulled out with a crane she is trapped under a slab to tell the truth this is extremely difficult call this is anything other than this terror said Pavel Antova with respect to Russia's invasion of Ukraine so he was close to Vladimir Putin but after this statement we don't know what exactly happened there are few pics that if you see on the image that you either be loyal to the president or 
you will be thrown out of the window either you are served the tea if you are loyal or we don't know you might be thrown out of the window such is the instances that is happening world over this is not the only instance there have been couple of other instances as well these are the people who have either committed suicide or their murder is yet not known what is the reason behind it and many people have passed away and all of these people are rich oligarchs who were present in russia so as many as 12 oligarchs have passed away in the past one year and some of the common themes in the cause of death include wristlet a stroke or suffocation heart attack body found hanging in garage suicide note found murder suicide of families fell off a cliff gunshot wounds to the head helicopter crash as well in this particular backdrop we also know for the fact that united states of america and multiple other western countries had also imposed sanctions on russia not only on russian government but also on these russian oligarchs as well they wanted to freeze the assets they wanted to ensure the civil and criminal asset seizures go on a period and at the same time they have no transaction from russian oligarchs to any other country so this was the sanction imposed by united states of america as well as multiple other countries but one question that is still left unanswered is why was the russian mp here in a three star hotel while he could have celebrated anywhere why did he not pick a five star hotel the answer is what you all know but we won't be able to say it now let's look into the main practice questions government of india has to revisit its migratory policies by engaging all stakeholders discuss for india to be remembered as the voice of the global south through the g20 presidency it needs to understand the mood and changes in africa elaborate so please write all your answers on the comment section peer review and do give positive feedback to your friends answers so this is it for today thank you for watching all the best